The British Isles have always been considered lands filled with enormous mysteries. Before the arrival of the Romans, they were even considered magical. But after Roman rule over much of the territory, many things began to change. The culture of the Latins began to spread, and the belief in a monotheistic religion, where one god rules sovereignly over the universe, spread throughout Brittany. But the influence of the ancient gods of Brittany had not left the land, and their most fervent believers and priests were considered to possess supernatural powers. But Rome's hegemony over the islands had come to an end. The great empire fell, and a dark period began in England. The lands were subjugated to greed and the thirst for power. Brothers fought against brothers in a never-ending war for dominance of the Isles. The cities, glorious in the past, became decadent after the demise of the Romans. The invasion of England by the barbarian tribes of Angles and Saxons seemed a clear sign that God had abandoned those lands. But it had been prophesied that the return of two brothers would again give light to those lands. They were Ambrosius and Uther Pendragon. The brothers fought against the fierce Saxon barbarians and the tyranny of Vortigern. On the battlefields, they regained the right to the crown of Brittany. Ambrosius's reign was short, and his younger brother dictated the fate of the land. Uther Pendragon was recognized as a brave warrior, but not all nobles fully recognized his authority. For several years, Uther warred against the Saxons and increased his kingdom through conquests. The hard heart of the King of Brittany, who had never experienced the pain of passion, was about to be shuttered by an unexpected visit. Along with her husband, Duke Gorlois of Cornwall, entered the room the Duchess Igraine, the most beautiful woman Uther had ever seen. The Duke introduced his wife to the Sovereign. Igraine seemed to come from the mystical Avalon, a land where magic still held much power. During the reception hosted by the King, the Duke of Cornwall realized that the King's intentions towards his wife were not the best. Igraine told her husband that the king had made her an indecent proposal. The duke was furious, but he managed to control his anger until the end of the reception. At dawn, the duke and his wife left the royal castle quickly, without saying goodbye. But one of Uther's guards, who had witnessed the visitor's departure, quickly told the king of the episode. The king was furious and ordered a messenger to go after the duke to deliver him a letter of royal summons. The message said that the Duke and Duchess would have to present themselves immediately before the King. Uther knew that it was inexcusable duty of his vassal to attend the summons of his King, and refusal of such a duty could be considered an act of treason. But the Duke knew that the King's real intention was to seduce his wife. For this reason, he told the messenger that he would not return to the castle with her, for he had an urgent business that required his attention. Overwhelmed by passionate rage, the king ordered his army to be assembled to march to Cornwall and teach the rebellious duke a lesson. The Duke of Cornwall ordered his fortress to be reinforced in preparation for war. The armies of the Duke and Uther met on the battlefield, but the outcome was inconclusive. The Duke chose to defend himself inside his castle as he thought that the king lacked the necessary strength for a successful siege. Uther besieged the fortress of Tintagel, where Duke Gorloi and Igraine were taking refuge. The siege had been going on for a long time and did not seem close to an end, as the duke had managed to accumulate many supplies before the arrival of the royal troops. The king was obsessed with Igraine, that long siege did not seem to positively contribute to Uther's mental health. With no other way out, Uther called Sir Ulfius, the king's right-hand man, and said, There is only one man who can end my affliction, and you know who he is. My king, we have no need of that devil worshipper. You are the rightful king of Brittany, anointed by God. Yes, I know who I am. But I believe that God is not very inclined to help one of his chosen ones disrespect one of the Ten Commandments. Disgruntled, 
Ulfius headed galloping off to the Welsh lands to recruit the king's old friend. Who is there? Sir Ulfius, by order of King Uther. What took you so long? I've been ready for hours. You swindler, you don't impress me by pretending you were already waiting for me. Don't be an imbecile, Ulfius. I have been waiting for years for the true calling of Albion Island. The king was heartened to see Ulfius approaching with his friend. Merlin, my old friend, I thought I would never see that wrinkled face of yours again. Your gray hairs show that you too are not rejuvenating. Uther told Merlin that he had been upset ever since he had met the Duchess Igrain, and did not know where to turn, for that an uncomfortable desire was consuming him from within. I know how to get you to unite with the beautiful Igrain, but it will come at a cost. I will pay whatever it takes to have just one night with that incredible woman. I will do as you ask, but this union will result in the birth of a child that you must hand to me. Would you sacrifice the child in one of your rituals? Of course not. Your Majesty has been spending too much time with that simpleton Sir Ulfius. By the way, we need him here. He will play an important part in our plan. With dusk, Sir Ulfius ordered the siege of the fortress of Tintagel to be lifted and the men to return home. From high on the wall, the Duke of Cornwall sensed that Uther's army was showing weakness and ordered his men to prepare for the attack. Gorloi and his knights left the fortress to crush Uther's retreating forces. Meanwhile, Uther and Merlin waited in hiding for the Duke's departure. The time has come. Merlin threw his cloak away and began his ritual. Uther felt both fascination and fear as he watched that powerful druid invoke the forces of nature and ancestry. Merlin withdrew a powder from one of his pouches he had around his waist and threw it at the king. When the cloud of dust cleared, Uther had assumed the body form of the Duke of Cornwall. The king rode to the duke's fortress. The duke is back! Open the gates! Uther's disguise seemed perfect. He ordered his horse to keep ready, for he would not be long. The king went upstairs to the duchess's room, where Igraine was standing with her daughter Morgana on her lap. The little girl ran to embrace her supposed father. Daddy is back! Uther avoided the child. Leave the room, child. Morgana was taken from the room by one of Igraine's maids, but the girl sensed something very wrong. Uther approached his beloved, who was surprised to see the lustful look on her husband's face. The king possessed Igraine and unleashed all his passion. The loving couple awoke to Morgana's cries. Daddy is dead! Daddy is dead! Igraine ran to help her daughter, and Uther took the opportunity to leave the castle. The king left the fortress before dawn, and the duke's army quickly returned. Daddy is dead! Calm down, my child. It's all right. As the army approached, Igraine saw her husband's body carried by his men. Igraine ran to see what was happening. My condolences, madam. He died fighting bravely. But how? The retreat of Uther's men was a trap. We were ambushed during the night by hundreds of archers. That's impossible. He visited me tonight. Surely it was his spirit, wanting to bid farewell to his beloved. Igraine was comforted by her ladies-in-waiting and led to her room. Uther quickly led his army to the fortress of Tintagel to negotiate terms of peace. The Duchess and her three bereaved daughters received the king. Little Morgana stared at Uther with a gaze filled with the purest hatred. I want to seal a lasting peace between our families. Through marriage, we will form an indissoluble alliance. In this way, your family's rights will be preserved. A few days later, the marriage was celebrated between Uther and Igraine. During their wedding night, she revealed to the king that she was pregnant. And whose child is this? The Duke's? I thought so, but I don't know anymore. He did not visit my room for months. But on the night of his death, I was visited by his spirit. Uther felt relieved to know that his wife's child was his own. The child was born 
he was a beautiful, healthy boy. But Merlin soon appeared at Tintagel Castle to fetch what he had been promised. The time has come, my king. Deliver me the child as promised. Uther snatched the child from the arms of the mother who tried to resist. Give me back my boy. Uther handed the boy to Merlin. Do not hand your son over to this monster, my lord, I beg you. He is the sole heir to the throne of Brittany. I made a promise to this man, and the time has come to keep it. Have you got eyes, Sir Ulfius? These eyes have seen dozens of wizards like you end up on the edge of the sword of men of God. Is that so? Then perhaps you are not as useless as I thought. Come with me. We must secure the future of the islands. Merlin and Sir Ulfius rode together to the lands of a noble knight known as Sir Ector. Merlin handed the child to the knight and asked him to raise the child as an adopted son. Take good care of the child, Sir Ector. The fate of our kingdoms is in your hands. Merlin and Sir Ulfius departed and left the child in the care of an honorable knight who would have much to teach the boy who would become known as Arthur.